my thing is this. These record labels are inclined to keep us as dumb as possible. They know that if we get to communicating and putting our heads together and comparing notes, that we're gonna figure out some shit real fast. Real fast. Real fast. Real fast. Real fast. Hey, what's good everybody it's your boy see through the script here back with another video and today i'm gonna be exploring the life and death of a pioneer of the texas rap community a man known for his outspoken personality and determination to put the south on the map i'm referring to none other than pimp c similar to the death of the latino rapper big pun pimp c was also found dead in a hotel room as a result of a combination of health and drug related issues Quick disclaimer, Texas is the home to the syrup sippers. It's literally part of their culture. While not everyone who partakes in sipping lean suddenly passes away, it's always a possibility. But like most of the stories on my channel, I aim to present the numerical narrative to allow people to analyze the story from a different perspective. So with that said, let's jump into it. Pimp C was born Chad Lamont Butler on December 29, 1973 in Port Arthur, Texas, which is a fairly small quiet town bordering Louisiana, roughly 90 miles east of Houston, Texas. Pimp C had music flowing through his veins. Spanning from jazz to soul, his father, Charleston Butler, was a professional trumpet player who shared the stage with the soul great Solomon Burke. His mother, Weslyn Monroe, also known as Mama Wes, served as a librarian and was a huge supporter of her son's passion for music. At around the age of six years old, Pimp C's parents divorced and his mother went on to marry a man by the name of Norwood Monroe, another musician working as a band teacher. Chad, aka Pimp C's stepfather, was actually the one who taught Chad how to read music and later influenced him to incorporate more musical instruments into his sound. At about the age of 10 years old, Chad was handed a Run DMC album from a friend. This was his introduction to rap music, and very quickly he knew this was something he was going to pursue. While his interest in rap music grew, he also pursued traditional musical interests, studying classical music in high school, and even earning a Division I rating for a tenor solo at a university interscholastic league choir competition. During Chad's time in high school, he formed his first attempt at a rap crew with his homie Mitchell Queen under the group name Mission Impossible. That quickly changed when Bernard Freeman, better known as Bun B, and Jalon Jackson joined the group and the name was switched to Black Menacesters. However, this too was also short-lived and half the members, Mitchell and Jalon, decided to leave the group to focus on their athletic pursuits. With Chad and Bernard remaining dedicated to music, they proceeded to establish a rap duo. Chad, aka Pimp C, concentrated on the beats, while Bernard, aka Bun B, took charge of the rapping. However, as soon as people heard Pimp C's strong southern accent and his twang and his flow, the duo knew both of them were destined to shine over the mic. With Houston getting more attention in the rap scene, with groups like the Ghetto Boys and the success of rap -a -lot Records, surely both Pimp C and Bun were eager to get their chance in the spotlight. So in true rapper fashion, the duo seek the help of a label, which at the time was the Houston startup, Big Time Records. This is when they got the chance to record and distribute their freshman album, The Southern Way. The album was only released as a cassette and featured a sample of the popular track Tell Me Something Good by Rufus and Shaka Khan. The two went on to promote this tape relentlessly throughout Texas, going to radio DJs around the state. They eventually convinced DJ Greg Street and Reg in Effect to play their single Tell Me Something Good, entering the 97.9 The Box Houston Home Jams contest. Despite winning the contest, they were actually disqualified due to their existing record label contract. 
However, this exposure significantly boosted the sales of the Southern Way and drew the attention of major labels. After spending about four years under Houston's big time records, the duo eventually caught the attention of Jive Records, which already helped break a bunch of well-known names in the industry, such as A Tribe Called Quest, Too Short, KRS-One, and more. This led to the duo signing a five album contract. In 1992, releasing their major label debut, Too Hard to Swallow. This tape featured a few of their tracks from their debut tape, The Southern Way, such as the song Something Good, with some changes to the verses, probably for commercial sales purposes, as neither Pimp C or Bun B refrained from holding their tongues and were pretty raw with the lyrics. Thankfully, track number three, Pocket Full of Stones, on their debut album, was slowly becoming a fan favorite. But it really took off in 1993 when the track was featured on the Hood classic Menace to Society soundtrack. That very soundtrack went on to reach number one on the Billboard Top R&B slash Hip Hop albums and number 11 on the Billboard 200, leading to even greater national exposure for the young duo. On their second studio album Super Tight, released on August 30th of 1994, the duo landed another hit featured on the soundtrack of the film a low down dirty shame with the track front back and side to side. It's noteworthy that Pimp C practically took on exclusive production duties for the entire album, with a few exceptions. This marked the beginning of his increased incorporation of southern musical influences blending funky bass lines and organ melodies with both Pimp C and Bun B's distinctive flows. You can hear listening to the project how the two began to bring a more braggadocious flow to the mic as they've now leveled up and began to start getting a lot more money coming their way. But it was UGK's third album titled Rod and Dirty that really propelled the duo into commercial success, selling 70,000 in its first week sales and going on to be recognized as their most popular album with the hit single One Day, which again was produced by Pimp C and really showcased his ability to flip samples and bring that southern soul to a track. It was that very song that the legendary Houston rapper Scarface shared with the rap star Tupac in the studio. Tupac was not just impressed with the sound, but more importantly with the subject matter and his ability to relate to these guys from down south. After the major success from the duo's third album, they went on a five-year hiatus until they released their fourth album, Dirty Money, on November 13th of 2001. This album, although it didn't do as well as the previous, still managed to make serious waves in the southern rap scene. By the year 2002, UGK had reached their 10th year anniversary since signing to Jive Records, and on September 24th of 2002, the duo released their fifth and final album on Jive Records titled Side Hustles. This album truly showcased the two's dedication to the pimp lifestyle, flowing over funky beats with a soulful touch to the bars. But leading up to the release of the duo's fifth studio album, all was not golden during their five-year hiatus. During the duo's semi-break from music following the release of their third successful album, the two continued to get love and praise throughout the state of Texas and were ultimately enjoying the fruits of their labor. In 1999, the duo linked up with another renowned rapper by the name of Jay-Z for his track, Big Pimpin'. This track helped spread UGK to an even broader audience in the East Coast. And with more confidence, fame, and wealth than before, Pimp C truly embodied the persona he established for himself as the Big Pimp. People in Texas looked at him like a superhero in many ways, but not everybody, of course. In a Vice article, it details the timeline regarding Pimp C's legal troubles, and as the story goes, it all started on December 16th of the year 2000. Now, if you know anything about Pimp C, he's really the type to carry his own, figuratively and quite literally. He'd often talk about how rappers of his time weren't about that life they portrayed. 
say, but you know, bitch. nah, but you know who crying? No, them bitch ass niggas that can't sell no records, man. They crying because they can't sell no records right now. Because Mike Jones got 15 cars, man, and 22 carat diamond in his ring, man. Get your mind on your shit. You can have some, too. You got to come down here and buy you some, bitch. I'm talking about straight business, man. I know they don't like me. But Pimp C was indeed about it. On December 16th of 2000, Pimp C rolled up on his own to the Sharpstown Mall with his mink coat, baggy blue jeans, and a 9mm pistol on his waistband, as he was always cautious knowing his status. His mother, Mama Wes, would always advise Pimp C to not roll alone due to his status and it simply being a risk. He'd usually have his homie DJ Bird with him, but Pimp C insisted on rolling dolo as it appeared he had a thing for someone working at the mall. While in the mall, he definitely stood out, so it wasn't too long before he was recognized. While walking around, Pimp C made a stop at a shoe store where the manager knew him well and always took care of him. While he was waiting for a new pair of Timberlands, a group of friends noticed that Pimp C was in the store. At this point, a woman by the name of Lakita Hewlett, also in the store, was frustrated with the manager due to her not being able to exchange a pair of shoes, and by then, she was already on edge. So the manager, trying to calm her down, asked if she knew who Pimp C was, to which she just snapped saying no, and basically went off saying that she doesn't know him, he's not popular, he's no Master P, and just basically wiling out according to the details. Pimp C, usually a calm and collected person, heard the commotion, causing him to confront her saying, quote, Hey man, uh, why you gotta talk that shit with my name in your mouth? He asked, you must don't watch the videos. Sorry guys, I had to do it. Again, Lakita just proceeded to disrespect Pimp C to his face, and that's when Pimp C stepped a little closer, still maintaining a distance. Lakita then reached into her purse, and Pimp C's first thought was that she was reaching for a weapon, to which Pimp C quickly flashed his 9mm on his waist, letting her know that he's got it on him. At this point, things got quite tense and quickly led to the two leaving the store. But as Lakita and her friends left, she passed by a security desk with a police officer, to which she informed him that there was a man that just threatened her with a weapon. And at first, the officer was a little skeptical until she yelled it again at the officer, leading them to run towards the opposite exit of the mall where they spotted Chad, aka Pimp C, approaching his car. This is when about eight officers surrounded Pimp C, demanding him to stop moving, but he didn't listen and proceeded to open the driver door when two officers rushed him to the ground, proceeding to handcuff him. In an interview with Feds Magazine, Pimp C stated, the officers kicked him repeatedly and essentially used excessive force. The police reports recount that Pimp C was resistant and aggressive to which force was the only way to subdue him. When they transported Pimp C to Central Jail, he was charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. To make matters worse, the police found a small baggie of mm -hmm. and a quarter ounce of yes, Lord. in his car, to which he denied the coke, but acknowledged that the weed was his. Early morning the next day, Pimp C posted a $10,000 bond and was back home. It's worth mentioning around this time, Pimp C met a woman by the name of Chinara Jackson. These two quickly became a couple and ended up having their first child together. So Pimp C knew that he had more than himself to worry about at this point. We some family men, we getting it paper. You know what I'm talking about? Months later, when in court, Pimp C pleaded no contest to the aggravated assault charge. While Pimp C was free, it was unfortunately short lived as he'd soon violate his probation, leading him to an eight-year sentence. On August 5th of 2002, Pimp C was officially in prison, and mind you, this story was big news throughout the hip-hop world, especially in the South, of course, with fans and his rap peers constantly shouting, the free the pill. Please free Pimp C. leading to the Free Pimp C movement. Now, while things were seemingly falling apart for Pimp C, being that he was in prison and all, less than a year into his sentence, at the age of 29, he would go on to marry Chinara on April 29th of 2003 while in prison.
During Pimp C's time in prison, he continued writing music and was doing his best to make the most of his time. I'm using this time to my advantage instead of just doing time. So I'm constantly reading, constantly trying to put some fat on my head. He even ended up releasing his first solo album titled The Sweet James Jones Stories with the help of rap -a -Lot Records on March 1st of 2005 aiming to capitalize off the free Pimp C movement and of course keep his fans satisfied with more music while he was away. At this point, things were starting to look a lot better for Pimp C as he got really lucky and found out that his 8-year sentence basically got slashed in half and by December 30th of 2005, the Texas legend was finally free. Now upon Pimp C's release from prison, he had a major shift in his mentality, as many do when they spend a fair amount of time behind bars. Pimp C became way more focused on things greater than the typical money, clothes and hoes, and wanted to change the direction of his music. It's a beautiful thing to see everybody selling as many records as they selling. And what I really want to see is everybody come together and get some more unity. But right now, it's these record companies that's trying to keep all of us separated. And we come together, maybe we can put a union together and we can unionize and really get this money. Because if I can compare my notes with the next rapper and he can compare here with the next one, we can figure out how these record companies messing over us. Know what I'm talking about? Know what I'm talking about? Know what I'm talking about? Although he was still talking about similar subject matter, he wanted to shine the light on the darker realities of being involved in the streets and the consequences that come with it. Pim C was also very adamant about unifying the South as he truly saw the potential the region had if all the artists put their beefs and egos aside. You can actually hear and see this on his second studio album, Pimpolation, released on July 11th of 2006. The single Knockin' Doors Down, accompanied by a video featuring cameos from many Texas rap notables, at this point, Pimp C was just trying to arrange a South reunion tour, bringing everyone together with the goal of making money as a team. Now let me just be real for a second here. We all know the labels don't like it when an artist with influence starts to go against the grain, especially when they promote something like Unity. Remember the ones behind the scenes profit so much off the low frequency music most artists are paid to put out. Anyways, it wasn't long before Pimp C would start to ruffle some feathers. Around July of 2007, during an interview with Atlanta's 107.9 radio station, Pimp C did not hold back the slightest bit, calling out Texas rappers Mike Jones and Lil Flips, absurd jewelry choices, claiming it made them look foolish. He also went at Texas rapper Lil Troy, leading to an infamous diss track. But Pimp C didn't just bark at the rappers, he also aired out industry exec Russell Simmons, alluding to the fact that he was involved in those suspect activities. Pimp C also took shots at the legendary Young Jeezy, essentially questioning his street credibility, but these two later remained on good terms. He then directed his energy towards R&B singer Neo, also accusing him of being a fruity individual. And lastly, he managed to piss off the entire state of Georgia by stating, Why you they think you dissing in Atlanta? Talking about Atlanta's not not the South. Okay, um, well, first of all, listen to this. I used to live in Atlanta from '96 to 2001. Okay. All right. That's the first thing. The second thing is this: when I get off the airplane in Atlanta, what time is it? It's whatever time it is out here, homie. It's like, Eastern Standard Time. But it's still on the south side of the map. Okay. But it's Eastern Standard Time, ain't it? On the south side of the map, yeah. Right. I answer my question. Is it Eastern Standard Time? Yeah, it is on the south side of the map. <laughs> All right. Say, bro. Who the hell is this? I'm the type of nigga stand on Benny, nigga. One man arm against 50, nigga. They can't do that. I stand on Benny, nigga. At this point, Pimp C would speak in his mind and didn't care what anyone had to say about it. 
This in turn strengthened his fan base as people couldn't help but respect his authenticity, especially in an industry full of liars. But despite his opinions about Atlanta, he still collabed with the ATL duo Outcast on the track International Players Anthem off UGK's 2007 release Underground Kings. During the 2007 BET Awards, rapper Kanye West won the Video of the Year Award, and during his acceptance speech, he literally offered his award to UGK and OutKast as he felt he didn't deserve it. I'm happy that I fixed it up and everything. Um, I just knew I looked at bus, I said, definitely UGK. Um, I feel like should've won, should've won this. Now let's fast forward to December of 2007. Pimp C was in Los Angeles working on his third solo album for rap -A -Lot Records. At the time, he was staying at the Mandarin Hotel, which was a popular hangout spot for many entertainers located in West Hollywood. While in LA, Pimp C linked up with the rapper Too Short, who had a show at the House of Blues about 10 minutes away from where Pimp C was staying. Pimp C basically acted as his hype man the whole show, just coming to show love, and the two plus their friends had a phenomenal time. For the most part, things seemed to be going well during his stay in the West. According to DJ Paul of 3-6 Mafia, the two were recording at his home studio in LA. After nearly half a day of hanging out and recording, DJ Paul's driver took Pimp C back to his hotel. Hi, um, it's an emergency here at the hotel. Mondrian. Mondrian? Yes. I don't know if he's breathing, but he's not awake. He's not breathing. He's not breathing? He's not breathing. More on the way up. At this hour, members of the hip-hop community are mourning the shocking death of well-known Port Arthur rapper Pimp C. Pimp C, who was born Chad Butler, was one half of the rap group UGK and was found dead this morning in a hotel room in Los Angeles. Roughly a year later, the Los Angeles coroners determined that Chad, aka Pimp C, died of an accidental overdose off cough syrup paired with the sleep apnea that he suffered from. ABTV Studios at Parkdale Mall. This is your hometown news at 6. Good evening, Southeast Texas. I'm Jim Walker. And I'm Shelda Brigham. Up first tonight, thousands came out to pay their final respects to rap artist Chad Pimpsey Butler. Among the hundreds in the crowds were loved ones, fans, and well-known names in the music industry. This tragic news sent shockwaves throughout the hip-hop community, breaking the hearts of numerous fans, particularly those in Texas, especially considering he had just been released from prison a little less than two years prior. Many to this day are extremely suspicious regarding what exactly caused the Texas rap legend's death. Of course, the theories float around that he was poisoned the night before during a party at the hotel as per this Reddit post. While others suspect his years of drug use unfortunately caught up to him, leading to his tragic death. The West Coast rapper Too Short who as previously mentioned was with Pimp C before he died, stated in a DJ Vlad interview that Pimp C's death doesn't sit right with him and he just can't accept the details surrounding his passing. He goes on to express how after an artist dies, they get promoted in a different way, usually leading to more profit for the labels, a topic we talk about quite a bit on my channel. He also goes on to express his suspicions about celebrity hotel deaths, and how they're always alone when it happens. In another interview with Hip Hop DX, he even makes reference to the 27 Club, something we've also talked about in previous videos. And although Pimp C died at the age of 33, it is worth mentioning he died leaving 27 days in the year. Truthfully, like the majority of these celebrity death stories, we most likely won't ever get to know the exact details surrounding the artist's passing. But it is oddly suspicious that a year after Pim C dies, the UGK duo finally wins the 2008 BET Award for Best Group. This goes with what Too Short was saying in his DJ Vlad interview about artists getting more attention and accolades after their death. After the 2008 award, UGK's final studio album was released. 
this being Pim C's first posthumous project, and he made sure to leave his mark. On the track, The Game Been Good To Me, Pim C says, Unfortunately, like we've seen before, after an artist dies, their family are left dealing with the hardships, and not too long after Pim C's sudden death, reports came out that his wife Chinara was going at rap -a -Lot Records for the masters of his work. His wife also expressed that, despite the image and lifestyle of Pim C, their financials weren't looking the greatest prior to his death, and she was pretty confident that prior to his passing that they would be able to get put in a better spot. But unfortunately, when he died, this put his family in an awkward situation. Additional reports came out in 2016, stating Chad Butler Jr., the son of late rapper Pimp C, is fighting for control of his father's estate. Butler Jr. petitioned to remove his stepmother, Chanara Butler, as administrator of Pimp C's estate after the widow allegedly mishandled his money. In that same year, another report came out stating the Port Arthur estate that once belonged to rapper Pim C was valued at $309,000. The bank foreclosed the Oak Mount Drive home in May 2016. Chad Pim C Butler made millions of dollars as half of the iconic rap duo Underground Kings, but the recording artist was far from a financier. Unfortunately, the life of a rap star and pioneer isn't always going to be great. They tend to experience a wide range of highs and lows, often unimaginable for the average Joe. Now, I can't truly speak on how Pim C's family is doing now, but one could only hope they're in a better place mentally and financially. Lastly, before we get to the decode, funeral arrangements are pending for Westland Monroe, the mother of the late rapper Pimp C. She died Sunday morning at Texas Medical Center from complications of pneumonia and stage four lung cancer. Monroe was 66 years old. RIP to Mama Wes, she played a crucial role in preserving her son's legacy with numerous interviews revealing lesser known details about her beloved son. The first thing that I want to point out is just a quick little interesting fact. Both Bun B and Pim C were born in Port Arthur, Texas, and this is where they formed the duo Underground Kings. Notice how both equal 91 in the reduction ciphers. Earlier in the video, I went on to mention how UGK went on to sign their first major record label deal with none other than Jive Records. Notice that Chad Lamont Butler, his full name equates to 263, which is the 56th prime number matching the name Jive Records. Earlier in the video, I mentioned how Pim C got into some legal troubles stemming from his initial arrest on Saturday, December 16th of 2000. If you take from that day all the way until he was released from prison on December 30th of 2005 is a span of exactly 263 weeks. And remember, his full name, Chad Lamont Butler, equals 263 in the reverse cipher. All right, so now it's time to laser focus on the numbers specifically relating to Pim C's passing. Now, the first thing I want to point out is how his full name, which as we just mentioned, equates to 263, which is the 56th prime number, matches with the date he died when written as such, December 4th, and the phrase accidental death, which on the next slide, you'll see what I mean by that. Chad Butler, his real name, excluding his middle name, equates to 40 in the reduction cipher, matching the word overdose. And as you can see in the headlines, Pim C died of an accidental cough syrup overdose. Now here you can see that the phrase drug overdose and cough syrup equate to 153 and 171 and 117 in the ordinal ciphers. For the 171 and 117, those are merely permutations. The same numbers, just arranged differently. Also, as mentioned earlier, Pimp C, aka Chad Butler, did suffer from sleep apnea, which is characterized by blockage of the airways. And notice there's a three for three match with Chad Butler and sleep apnea. 
Here we can see the place Pim C died, West Hollywood, California, equates to 113, matching his cause of death. Now we also talked about how Pim C unfortunately died alone in a hotel room. Notice Pim C and hotel equate to 24 in the reduction ciphers. The specific name of the hotel was Mondoran, and notice it equates to 43 in the reduction cipher, and he died on December 4th of 2007, a date with numerology of 43. Now that we've recognized that Pim C died on a date with prime numerology of 43, we could see that his name Chad L. Butler equates to 43 in the reduction cipher, matching with the words poisoned and murdered, as well as rap -a -lot Records, the label he was working with to put out his third solo album just before he passed away. There were theories floating around that Pim C was actually murdered. And no, this isn't just me making stuff up. His own mother who passed away, Mama Wes, even believes that he too was actually murdered or rather poisoned by an individual who was quite shady that was with Pim C prior to his death. There is also an interview with 3-6 Mafia's DJ Paul where he states that he got a call from Pimp C's manager, which was Rick Martin, stating that Pimp C's body was found kneeling as if he was praying and there was blood everywhere and they assumed that he threw up. But then Julia Beverly, the woman who actually wrote the book about Pimp C's passing, also explains that the LA coroners expressed that Pim C didn't actually overdose, but unfortunately, all the media publications kept putting it out there that Pim C died of an overdose. However, when they actually talk about his death and did more autopsy reports, there are some people that are finding it hard to come to a true conclusion, and it could very well be that his sleep apnea paired with some lean that night did cause it, but again, there are reasons to believe otherwise. Let's talk about the many inconsistencies surrounding Pim C's death. All major reports stated Pim C was alone in his hotel room the time he died, when in fact many suggest that there were others with him. Allegedly a man by the name of Larry Adams, who has since passed away, was the person in Pim C's room that allegedly poisoned his drink while he was in the restroom. Edgar, Pim C's cousin, stated a potential motive being that Larry had given Pimp C upwards to $1 million for ownership of UGK Records and likely wanted Pimp C out of the picture. When it came to Pimp C's wife, Chinara, respectfully, her interview with the Donnie Houston podcast is not a good look. Her reasoning for leaving Pimp C in LA was very odd. In short, she states that their Bentley, which Chinara insisted Pimp and her take to the airport, and leave there needed to be moved as it was parked in a tow zone. She also mentioned that since they spent the day in LA that she wanted to leave because there was a club she wanted to attend, which I can't understand why that would be her priority unless she needed some sort of alibi. She also mentions that Pimp C had probation to attend the next day, matching the story of his cousin Edgar, and according to his cousin Edgar, he wouldn't ever miss that. Granted, he knew how much that could affect him, one should consider that if he was on probation, it's very likely that he was being monitored for excessive drug use and had to keep a pretty clean record, making me think that the overdose narrative is even less likely to be the case. Also, remember that the LA coroner, Captain Ed Winter, who passed away in 2023, was the first to say that he died of, quote, natural causes. Quote, there were no signs of trauma, no signs of drug paraphernalia, end quote. Chinara in the same interview even implies that Pimp C did not die from lean, so then what could have really caused his death? In the super tight TV interview with Pimp C's cousin Edgar, who might I add was a 33rd degree Freemason, claims to have denounced his association and has gotten right with God, which is strange in itself, stated that Chinara told Pimp C that his other cousin couldn't join him in LA because he had work, when in fact his cousin never said that leaving Pim C without his right-hand people in LA, and you would think his wife would want him surrounded by people he knows at all times. 
As mentioned earlier, the details that DJ Paul shared about Pim C being found in a praying position with blood everywhere certainly seems like a detail that reports would document unless individuals, certain individuals, were doing their best to create the narrative that it was an overdose. It was said that Mama West, prior to his passing, was hoping to get Pim C's body analyzed once more, but needed close to 200,000 at the time, which wasn't readily available. You don't find that suspicious. You don't find that suspicious. Now, according to that Reddit post I mentioned earlier by a member duck underscore Matthew five, he goes on to state short referencing to short was with Pim C that night. A girl I used to mess with from the valley in L.A. had also been hanging out with them that night. That same night before Pim had been found dead, she hit me up right when she'd left the hotel they were all hanging out at. She told me that some sketchy dude came up with a girl to supposedly bring some weed for Pimp C. Pimp didn't want to buy no pounds or ounces, but that's what the sketchy dude brought, probably thinking to make a big sale. She said that shit got awkward and tense over the weed situation, with the dude pretty much demanding someone pay for what he'd brought over. When it got too uncomfortable, her and her friend dipped out. Like I said, when she hit me that night, she was shook and kept saying how scary the weed dude and his girl were. Made the whole scene mad awkward and unsettling. The next day, Pim C was found dead. Now I can't tell you how valid this story is, but definitely take it with a grain of salt. Not saying it's impossible, but you never know. Now it's worth mentioning from Two Short's 41st birthday to Pim C's death, is a span of 240 days. Remember with the rules of numerology, we're left with the number 24, which matches Pim C in the reverse reduction cipher. Here I just wanna bring up how I noticed Pim C died 33 months from his first solo album at the age of 33 years old. And we all know that the number 33 is always a suspicious number in relation to the Freemasons. So if you want to hear more about that number on its own, go click the video that pops up right there. Now, many would probably question who would want Pim C sacrificed and for what reason? Well, if you know anything about Texas, when it comes to the rap scene out there, the infamous Jay Prince must be mentioned as he's basically the mob boss of the South. Although he worked closely with Pim C, it's not impossible to think that maybe Jay Prince didn't like the direction Pim C wanted to take his own music and the southern region, and potentially to prevent his impact from spreading even further had his life cut short. Again, this is just a theory and not a fact. Plus, this wouldn't be a shock to those familiar with hip hop, as the rapper Takeoff from the Migos was shot and killed at a bowling alley in Houston, Texas hanging out with his brother Quavo and Jay Prince's son, Jazz Prince. The point I'm making is Jay Prince is a powerful man known to have a lot of connections to the right people to maintain his position of power. Speaking on Jay Prince, if you calculate from what would have been his 43rd birthday to Pim C's death, it was a span of four weeks and six days, like the number 46. Notice the word sacrifice equates to 46 in the reduction cipher. But what can't be overlooked is that Jay Prince was 43 years old when the world lost Chad L. Butler, which if you remember earlier, also equates to 43, like rap a lot, poisoned and murdered. Again, you can make your own conclusions, but the numbers are looking hella suspicious. Bun B in this Hip Hop DX article states that although the duo wasn't signed with rap a lot in the early parts of their career, Jay Prince was always a mentor and practically on speed dial. Bun B states he didn't even try to make a dime off them, at least until they inked deals with rap a lot records around 2005, which again is just two years before the passing of Pimp C. Despite the numerous theories circulating, a search for Pim C dead at 33 is likely to lead you to articles referencing his use of codeine permethazine. To someone unfamiliar with his life, it may be assumed, given his history of drug use, that this played a significant role. It is intriguing to note that Pim C passed away just 25 days before what would have been his 34th birthday, the day he died had a numerological connection to the number 25, and the words codeine permethazine equate to 205, mirroring the number 25. The word death 
also holds the value of 25. So irrespective of the circumstances, there's a numerical alignment with the narrative presented to the world. Pim C was released from jail on Friday, December 30th of 2005. He died on December 4th of 2007, which so happened to be a span of 704 days apart. Notice the word rapper equates to 74 and the most basic cipher. Now finally, because I know those watching were probably wondering, well, if Pim C died and Bun B remained alive, was Pim C's death Bun B's Faustian bargain? It's a common theme on this channel that artists tend to lose someone extremely close to them just before or after they achieve a major accolade. This technically being the case for UGK, as the group finally won a BET award after Pimp C's death, leaving Bun B to accept the award on behalf of Pimp C. Now, Underground Kings, now after eight albums, 14 years together, mm -hmm. He dies, but you get a Grammy nomination. Wow. Yeah, it, it was bittersweet to say the least. 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 Truly, Pim C and Bun B went through a lot together, both good and bad. And although both men were fairly outspoken, Pim C was definitely more vocal and was also man enough to separate his words and feelings from Bun B. All right. Well, after saying that, listen to this. All my statements are my statements. That's how I feel. And feelings is like booty holes. Anybody can have their own feelings. That's my feelings. That ain't got nothing to do with Bun B. Okay, that's the first thing. So let's separate PLC statements from UGK and Bun B. That's the first thing we got to do. I say all this to present the possibility that Bun B might have known Pim C's time was coming up and was forced to stay quiet for his own safety. As a Faustian bargain states, Faustian bargains are by their nature tragic or self-defeating for the person who makes them, because what is surrendered is ultimately far more valuable than what is obtained, whether or not the bargainer appreciates that fact. Note the last album these two released as UGK, while Pimp C was still alive, came out on August 7th of 2007, exactly 17 weeks before Pimp C's death. Note the words rap and kill both equate to 17. To top it off, Pim C died exactly 107 days before Bun B's 35th birthday at the time. Note, ritual sacrifice and the word sacrifice itself equate to 107 and 170 like the number 17. So guys, there you have it. That is the story and decode of the legendary Texas rapper Pim C. Again, it's important you make your own conclusions about what actually happened to this man because I'm just here to lay out the information and the hidden numerical aspect behind it. So as we know, Pim C tragically passed away in his hotel room, just like the rapper Big Pun seven years prior. If you want to know more about that story, click the video up here. But seriously guys, I appreciate those sticking around to watch the whole thing. By now you guys know the drill, be sure to like the video and comment your thoughts down below. Was Pimp C a victim of the vicious music industry or was his death a relation to his syrup sipping habits? Also, don't forget to share the video and subscribe man, remember, all of those things are free to do. It's been your boy Script and I'm out of here. Peace. 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 Peace.